This is episode 34 of EO Radio Show. This episode is the third in a series discussing insider transactions by exempt organizations. In episode 32, I gave a general overview of the federal laws regulating the transaction of business between a tax-exempt organization and its insiders. Insiders includes directors, trustees, certain executives, substantial contributors, entities controlled by directors or substantial contributors, and their family members. In episode 33, we took a deeper dive into conflict of interest policies and considerations in deciding which insiders need to comply with the organization's annual conflict of interest disclosure procedures. Now, in this episode, we'll look closely at best practices for approving insider compensation decisions made by public charities and private foundations. Welcome to the EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource. Brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferella Braun and Martell. My name is Cynthia Rowland, and I'm a partner at Ferella. I'm a business and tax lawyer with more than 30 years of experience advising clients on nonprofit and charity law. Through this podcast, our lawyers and guests will discuss a range of legal and business issues impacting the nonprofit world because we understand you work hard every day to make your community a better place to live and do business. Many of our programs focus on the basics, and at times we'll do a deep dive into narrow and complicated legal issues. Again, welcome to the EO Radio Show. We're glad you're here. So as we start off the conversation about compensation of insiders, let's recap the rules that prohibit private benefit in general. By way of background, since the advent of 501c3, it has been a key feature of tax-exempt status that public charities and private foundations may not be operated for the private benefit of their insiders. When talking about public charities, the problematic insider transactions are known as excess benefit transactions. In the private foundation world, the rules refer to self-dealing. These rules are slightly different depending on whether the entity is a public charity or a private foundation, but the essence of the public policy behind these rules and the best practices that should be followed are the same. Also, if you want to get a recap or basic information on the penalties and the reporting requirements for excess benefit transactions or self-dealing transactions, go back and take a listen to episode 32. I go into the penalties and reporting in a lot more detail there, and you'll want to refer to that to understand why it's so important to follow these federal rules. So again, to recap, generally speaking, let's think about who are the disqualified persons with respect to private foundations and public charities. So these compensation rules that we're going to talk about today apply to disqualified persons with respect to private foundations that fit within these categories. They're foundation managers, a category which includes the private foundations, trustees, directors, officers, and other persons with similar authority. The substantial contributors to the private foundation, whether those are individuals or entities, the family members of those substantial contributors and directors and officers, and entities controlled by those persons. For these purposes, family members include ancestors, children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, and their spouses, but notably not siblings. There are complex constructive ownership and attribution rules that also apply. So now, for public charities, the definition of who is a disqualified person is slightly different because, for one thing, there is a look-back rule. In brief, a charity's disqualified persons include anyone who was, at any time during the five-year period ending on the date of the insider approval, in a position to exercise substantial influence over the affairs of the organization or a family member of that person. A position of substantial influence is determined in the public charity context by the magnitude of the responsibilities or powers the person holds in the organization or a totality of the facts and circumstances that tend to show that a person is in a position to exert substantial influence over the entity. The Treasury regulations implementing Section 4958 provide a procedure by which a tax-exempt organization that is a public charity can benefit from what is known as a rebuttable presumption. The rebuttable presumption establishes that certain compensation decisions with insiders are just and reasonable. The benefit for a public charity in meeting this standard is that, if audited, the IRS has the burden of proving to a court that the charity board's determination was unreasonable, or in other words, that the 
compensation was excessive. And the IRS is the party that has to prove to the court that there is sufficient contrary evidence to show that the compensation, in fact, was excessive. These are kind of geeky rules that rarely come into play since there are very few audits. But having the written documentation to back up the compensation decision and that meets these 4958 rules usually shuts down an IRS auditor's review on that point. The IRS Form 990 Schedule J and the 990 PF for private foundations also ask pointed questions about what procedures are used by the organization to approve compensation. So by following the specific rules of Internal Revenue Code Section 4958, The organization is allowed to rely not only on the rebuttable presumption that has become industry-wide best practice, but it also can complete its very public Form 990 and 990 PF in a way that shows that these best practices are followed. So in short, we strongly recommend that all 501c3 organizations, whether public charity or private foundation, should follow these procedures in every compensation arrangement to which it would apply. The IRS website has good information on these rules, and I'll include links in the show notes. By definition, the 4958 rules make it clear that the fair market value of economic benefits received for the performance of services determines what is reasonable compensation. In other words, reasonable compensation is the value that would ordinarily be paid for like services by a like enterprise under like circumstances. Note that this rule does not limit comparable pay to what is paid by nonprofit employers. Again, in other words, the rules do allow comparables to include for profit businesses and what they pay their employees for similar services. So, the essence of these reasonable compensation best practices is that in determining the reasonableness of compensation packages, all items of compensation provided are taken into account. These items might include all forms of cash and non-cash compensation, including salary, fees, bonuses, severance payments, and deferred and non-cash compensation. Also, the payment of liability insurance premiums in certain circumstances, or the payment or reimbursement by the organization of taxes and certain expenses under Section 4958, unless they're excludable from income as a de minimis fringe. All other compensatory benefits, whether or not included in gross income for income tax purposes, should also be included in the analysis. Also, a final point that might be relevant to a compensation approval is any foregone interest on loans. So you can see that the reasonableness of compensation needs to address all of these items and anything else that's unique under the circumstances of your tax-exempt organization. A question that often comes up in this regard is how to treat event tickets provided to employees and their significant other or spouse. Internal Revenue Code Section 132, which excludes from an employee's income certain fringe benefits, includes two categories that are relevant here. Those are the categories known as the no additional cost service and the de minimis fringe benefits. Public charities and private foundations in many circumstances take the position that providing free tickets to events sponsored by the charity or foundation can be treated as no additional cost services where the employer is not incurring additional costs or foregoing income by providing the event ticket. Gala tickets also readily fit within the de minimis fringe benefit definition, although that is always considered under the specific facts and circumstances of each situation. Generally speaking, a benefit is treated as de minimis when, in addition to being administratively impractical to account for, the employer-provided benefit is of little value and is infrequently distributed to employees. There's no bright-line value limit for this purpose. Providing tickets to directors and substantial contributors is analyzed under a slightly different rule. It's not technically within Code Section 132 as a de minimis fringe, since directors and substantial contributors aren't employees, so the guidance of Code Section 132 doesn't apply. However, if the director or substantial contributor and their spouses are attending as part of their official duties, where the foundation in question is, say, a sponsor of the gala, The value of the tickets would not be treated as a reportable taxable payment to the director and so would not be reported on their 1099 for the year. 
The rationale for excluding these amounts as from taxable compensation to the director or substantial contributor is found in the rules that permit directors to be reimbursed for reasonable expenses related to their services as a director. In other words, if the director paid for the gala dinner and attended as part of the service as a director, the reasonable portion of the expense would be reimbursable. Note that for a substantial contributor who is not a director or does not have any other official role with the organization, this analysis might not work so well. So it's important to check with counsel if a substantial contributor will receive any benefits from the organization. Also, keep in mind that the answer when thinking about tickets and reimbursements of directors and benefits for directors is that the answer would be different if the gala tickets had nothing to do with the foundation or charity in question. For example, if a healthcare charity, for some reason, decided to buy tickets to a golf tournament for a Save the Whales charity in Mexico, it would be a stretch to say that the attendance by an executive employee or a director is part of their services to the foundation. So moving on to the compensation approval itself, an important aspect of the compensation approval that has to be taken into account is that it is important to clearly indicate the intent to treat each benefit as compensation when the benefit is paid. There is a bright line rule for public charities that are looking for the protection of the section 4958 safe harbor. That protection applies for benefits only where the intent to provide it as compensation is actually addressed in the written substantiation of the economic benefits at the time they are given or paid to the insider. So some ways to provide this contemporaneous written substantiation include in the organization's signed written contract with the employee or executive or the organization reports the benefit as compensation on the original Form W-2, Form 1099, or its Form 990 for the organization for the year in which the benefit was provided. Another contemporaneous substantiation element would be if the person in question, the employee or executive or director, actually did report the benefit as income on their original Form 1040. So in other words, if some benefit is left out of the compensation approval, and not included, say, on the W-2 or the 1099, and the IRS audits the charity, the charity and the executive can't later go back and justify that expense as part of reasonable compensation. So, for example, say the comp approvals and all the paperwork didn't address a company-provided car, the organization and the insider can't later go back and say the value of the car could have been part of reasonable compensation and could have been included in the safe harbor. After the fact, you can't go back and do that. So the takeaway here is that the charity really has to capture every single benefit that is intended to be part of reasonable compensation, and it needs to capture that when documenting the compensation at the time it is approved by the relevant governance body of the organization. So to recap here, the charity's documentation, either in board minutes or in a written board action by written consent, should include all of the following elements for each compensation decision that it intends to have the benefit of Section 4958 Safe Harbor or simply to follow the best practices. So here are the essential elements for the written contemporaneous documentation. One, the documentation should recite that the compensation was approved in advance by the governing body or a committee that is permitted by state law to act on behalf of the governing body. The documentation should also recite that the governing body making the decision was composed entirely of individuals who did not have a conflict of interest with respect to the transaction. Third, the charity's documentation should show that the governing body obtained and relied on appropriate comparability data prior to making its determination. So let's talk a little bit about what comprises comparability data and the appropriate level of due diligence. The independent directors or trustees that are considering a compensation decision are required to conduct certain diligence and document and should document their efforts to demonstrate that the compensation package is not excessive. The governing body will be considered to have considered appropriate comparable compensation if, given the knowledge and expertise of the governing body's members, it has information sufficient to determine whether the transaction is reasonable in its entirety. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, while these diligence and documentation rules are in the rules that technically apply to public charities, they also set the best practice standards for private foundations as well. 
The due diligence that the board will rely on needs to be in writing. The analysis of the facts and comparability data should be contained in or attached to the minutes or the board resolution and should reflect reasonable inquiry and investigation appropriate to the size of the transaction. In addition, the board minutes or resolution should describe the organization's relationship with the party to the transaction, that is, the person being compensated. The efforts made by the organization to consider other candidates and other compensation packages with other independent service providers. The reason that the compensation decision for this particular employee is in the best interest of the organization. The technical safe harbor applies only if the written documentation is created before the later of the next board meeting or 60 days after the final actions of the governing body in relation to the particular compensation of this insider. The board minutes or the board resolution in writing should clearly reflect that the insider or other interested persons were not participating in conversations among the members of the governing body about the compensation decision and that those interested persons did not vote on the compensation package. So when thinking about a transaction that involves compensation of an executive, the board should gather and evaluate data regarding comparable salaries ordinarily paid for like services by similar organizations. This data can be derived from independent industry surveys by board members or staff that they can rely on. The data can be documented compensation of persons holding similar positions in similar organizations in the same geographic region or expert compensation studies or other evidence of comparable salaries. The best practice for an exempt organization approving insider compensation is to be certain that the written record includes the board's analysis and includes as attachments to the compensation resolution, a comprehensive job description of the position, a current resume for the insider being compensated, the insider's qualifications for the particular position, and the salary including all benefits and perks provided, including the value of anything else such as housing, vehicles, and other benefits. So what does one do if the compensation wasn't approved in accordance with these best practices and the board or the governing body finds out after the fact that it didn't meet these standards? While retroactive diligence and approval won't fit within the safe harbor, Having a written record and independent approval can go a long way to reducing the risk of an IRS challenge. If the amount of compensation is significant, the exempt organization's bo governing body may want to check with legal counsel. Finally, it's important to keep in mind that hospitals are subject to special compensation rules under Code Section 4959, and any tax-exempt organization that pays compensation of greater than $1 million per year needs to be aware of the special rules of Internal Revenue Code, Section 4960. Those two special rules, as well as some exceptions to the excess benefit rules, are beyond the scope of this episode. I'll include in the show notes the IRS checklist for compensation diligence, which can help to meet the Internal Revenue Code requirements as interpreted by the IRS to ensure that the organization complies with these rules. If you would like more information about the types of nonprofits discussed, that is, the public charity definition and private foundation distinctions, Episode 5 of EO Radio Show is the Nonprofit Basics episode that describes the distinction between public charities and private foundations. So check that out if you want a refresher on those rules. So that's all for this episode. I'm Cynthia Rowland, and you've been listening to EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource, brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Varela Braun & Martel. If you have suggestions for topics you would like for us to discuss, please email us at eoradioshow at fbm.com. That's eoradioshow at fbm.com. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, make a difference. 